well, the sentence says, in a production process that is complex and often um, unpredictable, roles that start out discreetly defined may become quite blank. Um, now, the wrong thing to do is to answer based on your gut. The wrong thing to do is to just come out of the word that sounds nice in this context. Because <laughs> anything could sound nice in this context. Let's look at the information provided. So we understand what the sentence says. It says that roles start off a certain way, but then they end up a certain way, right? And also we know that um, the production process itself is complex and unpredictable. So that's information about this particular context. Let's look at the blank. What is the blank about? Well, the blank is about the roles um, and what we know about them. What do we know about the roles? Well, it says that it starts out discreetly, but may become something, suggesting that it becomes the opposite of that. What does discrete mean? Discrete is to be, uh, by the way, there's another word called discrete, which is something else, which means to keep things to yourself, uh, to, to uh, practice discretion, right? To keep a secret is to be discreet. Uh, that's a different word. Discrete, on the other hand, to be discrete is to separate, to be separate, very good. To be separate, to be, um, to be isolatable, right? Separate, um, you know, a, a, a piece of his own, right? It's not muddled up to each other. So it's saying that these roles start off as, as separate discernible entities, um, or, um, yeah, but then they become quite the opposite of that. So the opposite of separate, well-defined is not very well-defined. It's to be like a motley of things, very, uh, very mixed up, very, um, you know, very jumbled up all over each other, right? Very good, yeah, uh, discrete, uh, um, a synonym for that is separate. The opposite would be not necessarily non-separate, but all muddled up together. Great. And by the way, you should do this. Once you make a prediction, and you might have made the prediction, do not keep this, keep this in your head. Put it down in your scratch paper. Write down what your prediction is in as simple a way as possible. The prediction must be simple, either a bunch of words or a single word. Or just recycle the word and you know, find an action. Um, write it down in your scratch paper. This ensures that you don't forget it when you go to the answer options. And there is a, there's a psychological effect that makes you look at something and then decide based on this data rather than what you've already decided. It's a very dangerous thing, especially on the GRE, because a lot of these answer options look appetizing, right? If you forget this, you're going to make mistakes. So put that down so that it's a valid comparison. Let's see. So mixed up, jumbled up. Let's compare that. Does confused mean that? Absolutely, right? It's, it definitely means can, it jumbled up. The rules become confused. They become a certain way. So that's, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> perfunctory. I'm assuming that some of you don't know what it means. We'll come to that. Independent. Independent is sort of similar to discrete. Uh, this is a trap, by the way. Right? You, might, you might not have realized that there is a contradiction going on. Um, because again, your complex and predictable are good... Um, a good indicator is that things are not what they seem. Independent is a trap. That's all. Have you heard of the word covert, like covert operations? Something done stealthily, something done in a way that people don't know what's going on, right? The opposite of that is overt. To be quite obvious, uh, outwardly showy, like you, you tell people what you're doing. You know, there's no assumptions about what you're doing. Overt. That doesn't really make sense. That doesn't mean mixed up or jumbled up. Exacting is to be um, is to be precise, to be to be very exact, to be like a perfectionist is exacting. Also, it could also mean to demand a lot of your work because that person, because it's a perfectionist kind of um, routine. Um, so that's also out. It has nothing to do with mixed up or jumbled up. Correct. Surreptitiously is a very good alternative to uh, covert. Um, Although their meanings are slightly different in context, like surreptitiously means sneakily, 
uh, slyly without the other person knowing, or covert would just mean that you need to do it that way without any tone attached to it. So while one is slightly negative, covert is not necessarily negative all the time. Um, which brings me back to perfunctory. Remember when you were a child and your parents told you, you know, you did something naughty and your parents told you, you know what, time out, go to your room, study, right? Uh, do your math homework, right? Um, and you did, but you didn't really do it, correct? You, do it, you did it superficially. Um, you did, did it for the sake of doing it, per function, right? For the sake of doing it. What this word means is that you do something, it's, something is done without much involvement, or depth. It's done for the sake of doing it. So if something is done perfunctorily, it's not, a, not, going, not going to be of great quality. It's not going to be very, it, it's not going to be a product of interest, right? A synonym to this is cursory. Very similar, uh, cursory, uh, you, sometimes interchangeable. Uh, superficial, like you said, is also a neutral um, replacement for the word perfunctory. Perfunctory is almost always negative. That's out. That doesn't mean mixed up. The answer has to be confused, right? So here, even if you didn't know some of the words, through elimination, you should have been able to get to A. Why? Because you followed method and the data there that you've represented in your scratch paper, right? Your scratch paper should look like that. Um, you know, you've eliminated that, you've eliminated that, you've eliminated that. The most obvious answer therefore is A, right? So by doing this, you weed out a lot of these silly mistakes, and I put them in quotes for a reason, uh, that you're likely to make on the GRE. Why do I put quotes? Well, there are no silly mistakes on the GRE. They're designed that way. Every step of the way, in every question, there are many instances where they know that a test taker will make certain assumptions or will do something that is not very organized or methodical, and that will leak out possibilities for errors. To prevent that, you have to be methodical. You have to realize that being organized, being methodical is the only solution to getting a very high score. There's no two ways about it, right? Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a genius. It doesn't matter if you're someone with really high IQ. You will still make these mistakes if you're not intelligent. Like me, after 10 years, when I see a text completion question, multiple blank, and I don't follow the process when I sort of do it by the year, um, because you know, 10 years, I still make mistakes. <laughs> but if I follow steps, I never make mistakes. And that, that, that's a testament to how uh, important being methodical is. So these are the steps we followed. And this is sort of a checklist you need to go through every time you solve a text completion question, a single blank one. Um, correct. And I will talk more about it. Um, so, if, if, you know, if you're on a phone or a computer, take a screenshot of this and this method or this checklist is very important uh, to follow, especially when you're practicing questions after you've practiced, when you're evaluating or when you're reviewing your questions, I'll show that every part of this checklist was ticked off. If you didn't, if one of these was not ticked off, you probably made a mistake. If you made a mistake, it's very likely, it's very likely that you did not follow all the processes, right? Um, so this is what we did. We read the entire text. When you read the text, do not bother about filling in the blank. Don't fill in the blank as you read. That's a terrible idea. Why? Because, like you said, GRE is a psychometric test. They know how you think. They don't want to see if you can intuitively come up with stuff. Then what is it actually testing, right? Instead, they want to see if you can work within the scope of the data provided and make valid inferences based on the data provided. That's the skill that's being tested, inferential reasoning. So to do that, you have to ensure that you don't bring in your own assumptions when you read it. Read the text, understand the meaning of the text. Don't worry about filling, the blank, filling in the blank right now. Once you've done this, then move to the blank. When you move to the blank, focus on the blank. Ask yourself, what is the blank about? That will tell you what the, well, that will lead you to the keyword. What is the blank about? In the previous instance, it was the role. And then I asked myself, what exactly about the role does the sentence tell me? That is the keyword. It told me that um, they are sometimes very discreet. And then there were uh, other kinds of keywords, triggers and transitions that told me that what we know about this particular item is not the same as what the blank is talking about. So we knew that it was an opposite word and that led us to the prediction that we made, which takes me to the next step, make a simple prediction. 
make it right in worst case you may have to just think about the connotation or just reuse the um, the the keyword itself but you have to make a prediction this ensures that you don't go into selection drive bias or something else there's another kind of bias that I'll talk about in a in a short time um and again these biases are potential for these biases are built into this test um again what it means for it to be a psychometric test is that these are designed by psychologists they know how you think they they're not testing your english they're not testing your mathematics they're testing your ability to make decisions and also to be able to avoid logical fallacies or cognitive traps in a situation that is rife with potential for you to fall for for uh, these logical traps right and the only way to do that is to follow method to ensure that you have every part of your step covered once you make a prediction don't keep it in your heads scribble it down in a scratch paper it can be a word it can be a phrase scribble it down in a scratch paper so that you have a, a valid concrete concrete reference point you can go back to in fact going forward i would suggest pick up a notebook pick up a pen and scribble down the predictions whenever we have to make them right do that you need to internalize this method it has to become like second nature whenever you see us a, a text completion or science equals question the next thing is you evaluate it when you go to the answer options again another thing that a lot of people do is that they forget about the prediction that they made they just look at the answer option and say okay that could fit that that could fit that that could fit that that idea remember they know how you think and they know the kind of phrases that people usually come across so some word that might sound good in a context may not be relevant to that particular sentence or the blank instead match the answer options with the prediction and evaluate it you're going to assign one of these symbols to the to to each answer option as you go through it and that will consolidate your evaluation process right so for example if it's a single blank question i don't know what the i, I mean um, i know that i know what the word means but it does not mean what the prediction is right i get rid of it i think it could work i don't know what this word means and then i look at it in a scratch paper and decide b is the answer right i'm not going to make any assumptions about c because i don't know what it means i'm going to select b or i could you know uh let's say you know i've eliminated most of the answers i don't know what c means then it has to be true that c is the answer right so by following this method you ensure that you don't introduce any errors into your process and that you are always objective in your method right let's try this out um let's increase the difficulty a little bit this is a double blank question right uh, we will talk about the method but you have to follow the same process instead of looking at it as one big chunk try to break it down into small two smaller chunks um try it out i'd like to know what your answers are Okay. That's quick. I think you've solved this before, have you? That's that's quick. Okay. All right. Perfect. It is BNF. Good job. So Zen says recent years have seen a disheartening string of revelations um in which everyday items once considered blank a found to contain blank chemicals so we realize that there is a keyword here disheartening so this is not a good thing that can lead us to the conclusion that this have to be harmful because it is harmful the word baneful means harmful bane versus boon boon is a blessing bane is a curse right benign is harmless complex as makes sense the problem that i was anticipating that you didn't fall for is ubiquitous <clears throat> you might have looked at the word every day and decided it's ubiquitous but good job you you focused on the right thing and made the right conclusion which is that we need a word that's opposite to harmful right everyday items that are considered not harmful right or harmless 
are actually harmful. So the word that means that is innocuous. The root nox means harm or toxic, like noxious. Uh, innocuous means that without toxin, right? Um, insalubrious, salu, as in when you, you know, when you drink, you say salu, which means to good health. Uh, salubrious means promoting good health, to good health. Uh, insalubrious, yes, something that does not promote good health, that is not good for you. Great. So to review the process, we read the entire blank. We read the entire text. Again, remember, do not fill in the blank as you read. You will be tempted, especially when there are multiple blanks. Do not be tempted to do that. Instead, read the entire thing, get the context, get the general gist of it, move on to the easiest blank. In this case, the second blank was easiest because it was easy to find the uh, clue for. Also, the first blank was dependent on the second blank. It needed to be the opposite of the second blank. So the second blank was the obvious skip. Find the keyword and trigger for it, make a prediction, evaluate those three answer options for that particular blank, make a decision. Again, reuse keywords, use phrases, whatever helps you make a prediction quickly. Don't take too much time trying to make a prediction. It, it can be as simple as you'd like, it can be multiple words. As long as you're able to make a rough estimate of what the answer should be, you're fine. And it is relevant to the context. And of course, you value the answer options. And once you're done, move to the other blank, right? And do this iteratively until you are left with no other blanks. So instead of looking at it as a very complex three, one by three to one by three to one by three situation, you are making it into three single blank questions, which substantially reduces the complexity of this entire process, right? <laughs> Excuse me. Increasing the difficulty a little bit more. And I'll keep doing this throughout the day, right? Um, try this one out. Again, try to put in all that we've discussed so far, try to use the method, then you know what the answer is. Thank you, Preeti. I'd like to hear from the others as well. Okay. Anyone else? Fair enough. I think we've got a reasonable sample of answers. Let's look into it. Um, so Zen says, managers who categorically squelch insights, squelch meaning suppress, like kill it right then and there, right? Squelch insights from low tier employees run the obvious hazard of dash or doing something to creativity. Conversely, their uh, these very same managers um, are more likely to do something to any idea that flowed down from the top brass. So it's saying that they do something with their uh, their lower employees, the employees are lower than they are, their subordinates, but they do something else when it comes to their uh, to information that comes from the higher ups. Well, the easiest blank to solve here, the easier blank to solve here is the first blank, right?
because well, uh, pretty, I'm muting you uh, because yeah, you can unmute if you want to say something. But ideally, the Q and A would be a better with better time, right? Sorry about that. Um, so. The, looking at that blank, they do something to creativity. Um, what do they do? Well, they squelch insights, which means they crush it, right? They crush it or kill it, right? So what do they do to creativity? They sort of um, kill off or suppress. We definitely need a negative word, don't we? Right? Not a problem. Um, looking at the answer options. Again, let's follow process. A says fomenting. Uh, it's a big word. Let's assume we don't know what it means. Sparking. We usually use the word sparking with respect to um, uh, you know something that sparks uh, motivation or sparks action, something that's positive. That can't be it um, because that doesn't mean kill. Smother is to essentially you know smother someone to sort of suffocate them, and that could work. Uh, again, they're using this in a figurative way. Well, you know, you're not, you obviously can't smother creatively, creativity literally, but from a figurative standpoint, right? Um, you might have heard, don't, don't kill my vibe, right? You can't kill the vibe. Similarly, you can't smother creativity, but figuratively, it does, make sense. it does make sense. And it sort of goes in line with crushing and, um, and killing, right? So this could be the answer. Let's keep that. Um, the second blank, it says conversely, so that's a trigger. These very same managers are most likely to dash any idea that flowed down from top brass. So while they are like dictators squelching any, um, any, in, any creativity from the lower up, they are doing the opposite with the top management. So what are they doing? Well, they are, um, they are, you know, they are, you know, sort of pandering to, let's think of a simpler word, they're sort of agreeing completely, right? Or um, going all in, accepting completely without any hes hesitation, because we need the opposite of squelching. Wholeheartedly accept, right? Unacceptingly, uh, unquestioningly embrace fits that context. Embrace is to accept as your own. Again, it's a figurative meaning here. Um, that makes sense. Um, arbitrarily denounce. Denounce is to say bad things about it. Say that you know you don't like this. This does not go along with what should be right. But we know that conversely suggests that this has to be the opposite of that. He is a trap, by the way. If you missed out the trigger, you may have not. Um, you may have ended up picking E for echo. Conditionally approve. See the problem with F is that though it seems tempting, can someone lower to you approve your ideas? Not really. And also the word conditionally doesn't work here because we need the opposite of, uh, we need the opposite of uh, squelching, right? We need something which means out and out acceptance. D should be the answer. Comparing A to C, C is the right answer because we're sort of sure about C. A, we don't know what it means, which takes me to A. I'll explain that. Uh, is my voice breaking up? If there are any network issues, please let me know. No? Okay, fair enough. Um, commenting reminds me of the scene from, really? I don't remember that. Well, I've seen the show multiple times, but I don't remember foment. Fair enough. Foment is to cause something to happen, to sort of stir up, right? Um, the, um, you know, something could foment some action. The new legislated legislature fomented protests all around the country to stir up to action, to, to spark, but not necessarily to spark in a positive way, not necessarily, right? Um, so that's out as well. C for Charlie and D for Delta are the right answers. Unquestioningly, unquestioningly embrace, which is the opposite of to smother. Okay, to incite action, correct. Um, again, if there are any queries about this, if I need to clarify anything, let me know. All right, so let's, let's take things to the next level. Um, 
let's try to, you know let's try to put what we've discussed so far um in context of really hard questions and by the way this is not the hardest questions you this is just a trial right um we're going to see really hard questions and these are official questions so if you've actually been preparing you might have seen them before but that's all right um the discussion points that we make should help you understand the the mechanisms of this test and help you deal with it a little more effectively right and you can you can essentially carry it forward to all the questions that you see that's the idea i'm not going to teach you idiosyncratic methods to solving questions but something that would work globally okay um try this out take your time once you're done put down your answers let's have a discussion yeah i was just going back to show you the slide right and okay fair enough so i will wait a little bit more to for you to solve it this this again is a difficult one take it back I'm going to give you one more minute. I'll be right back. Okay, let's try this out. Uh, most of you are right. Again, the catch here for this question type, there are no partial points, right? So let's take a, take a look at the sentence. Again, don't fill in the blank as you read. Read the entire thing. Understand what it's trying to say. The incipient. Blank regarding taxes. Incipient, by the way, means very new, something that's just born. Um, could affect trade between the two countries much more than the blank banana imports. So it's talking about a particular quality about these imports uh, and a particular feeling about the taxes. 
um, which has been going on for years. Unfortunately, the trade regulations seem to be ignoring both disagreements. What is the easier blank? Well, it depends. I think both are equally easy to solve. Um, the context says that could affect between the two countries much more than the blank of the other, suggesting that while this is something, this is a higher version of that something. Right? So let's figure the second blank out. What do we know about the second blank? Well, we know that these two have a similarity in that um, there are disagreements. Um, am I audible now? All right. Um, so yeah, from what we know about both these situations is that there are disagreements. Um, so let's work with that, right? We need a word which means disagreement here. <clears throat> Profitable dealing in does not mean disagreement. Predicament regarding. Well, a predicament is a um, a bad situation, an unfavorable situation, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a disagreement. Festering dispute works. A dispute essentially means a disagreement. Let's keep F. And from context, we realize that the first thing could affect uh, the country more than the second thing. So this has to be much worse. So a higher form of disagreement, maybe a fight, right? All out fight. A row uh, means a fight. Accord is a 180. Accord is uh, to go along with. When you are in accord, um, you go, go along with. You are in harmony with whoever else is involved. Investigation doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean fight. Row is the answer, right? Um, I guess this wasn't as difficult as I assumed it was. And now that I think of it, uh, let's in increase the difficulty a little bit more. Again, for anyone who had an issue with any of this as to why you could not make a prediction for a certain thing, think about the steps that you followed. This definitely could not have been a vocabulary issue, right? These are not very well, as are not very uncommon words. Sorry if I'm making that complicated. Uh, the problem, if any, would have been um, a failure to follow steps. As simple as that. Um, Let's continue this conversation again. If there are any problems along the way, if you want me to explain something a little bit more, if you need more clarity, let me know. Try this one out. Triple blank, again, the process is the same. Read the entire thing. Do not be tempted to fill in the blank as you read. Find the easiest blank, predict for it, solve for it. Move on to the next blank and keep doing that until you get your answers for everything. Let me know once you're done. Take the time that you need. Once you're done, put down your answers. All right. Others? Again, this, this is going to take a little bit of time. Let me know what you're doing.
Okay. All right. So this is a good example of a question that sort of goads you into making decisions um, based on your gut. What sounds right? Because if there is enough complexity in this question that your your brain will sort of give up. Happens. Happened to me when I tried this first, right? Um, but you do that, you're going to make mistakes. Because, like I said, your gut is not very reliable, um, especially in complex situations on the GI. And you're going to run into them very often on the GI. You want to have a system that works every single time. Let's read the sentence. Let's figure out what it's trying to talk about. Putting a cash value on ecolo ecological services provided by nature, such as the water filtration service, Provided by, uh, I can see the word, but I'm not able to read it. Uh, forested watershed had historically been a blank process. Um, early attempts at such valuation resulted in impressive, but blank figures that were seized uh, seized on by environmental advocates. And then, when they when these figures were later blank. They were used by opponents to tar the whole image. And that's the only piece of information that we know that can help you make, you know, fill in the puzzle. We know that the opponents use this information to tar the image. So from that, we can work backwards. So the sentence overall is talking about how um, <clears throat> it used certain data, it used certain valuations, which on the surface seem to have worked. But it didn't, right? And, and they used this to, and the opponents used this to sort of bring it down. Um, correct. So the second one is an easy kill. Um, the second one is an easy kill, yeah, because we know that they used something about these figures to bring it down later. So how much, how much, how must these figures be? Um, for them to have used it against them. Well, we know this, impressive, but, right? So these figures, while impressive, were sort of not necessarily impressive factually, which would mean that they were, well, wrong or distorted, right? Correct. So unsound words. Redundant is a trap. If something is redundant, it doesn't necessarily make it wrong. And you don't necessarily have to discredit it on the basis of that. So even if this was a maybe, you would have eliminated it in the next layer of elimination. Understandable again is out because you know it was it tarred, it was used to tar the image. Um, so obviously, then if it was unsound, then what did they do to it? They did something bad to tar the image, so therefore they later um, and then when these figures were later. Um, disproven, right? Or uh, what is the word for that? Um, it's right there in the answers. Discredited, they were used by opponents. Ignored, um, doesn't necessarily, if it were ignored, then how does it tar your image? How does it ruin the idea? It does not, right? Um, confirm again is a 180, doesn't really work. Uh, discredited has to be the right answer. Going all the way back to the first blank, what is this talking about? It's talking about the process of, of valuing ecological services. Let's consider the entire context. We know that they were able to find some valuation, and the valuation looked good, but then it turned out it wasn't that great. It wasn't necessarily factual. Um, and then this was used to ruin the whole idea. So I could say, uh, been a bit of a pain, right? Um, has been a problematic process, which is the answer, right? It's definitely not straightforward. If it was straightforward, it wouldn't have so many problems attached to it. And it's not dispassionate. Any anyone knows what the word dispassionate means? Uh, if you if you're a student, you probably I've probably drilled this down into your, into your head multiple times. Um, any idea what the word dispassionate means? Uh, a simpler word, phlegmatic could mean a lot of things. Uh, not really, it's not synonymous with dispassionate. Yes and no. 
So dispassionate means to be fair, to be unbiased, right? Suggesting that you are not driven by your passions. A synonymous uh, word to this is disinterested. When you go to court, you want your judge to be disinterested. This doesn't mean, well, there is a secondary meaning which says not interested in something. GRE always uses the pr primary accepted definition, which is to lack vested interest in, to be dispassionate or unbiased, right? So there you have it, problematic, unsound, and discredited. Again, if there were problems with it, let me know. Try another one. Indian patch. <laughs> if you're playing the odds, you're going to lose in this one. <laughs> um, so before we go into that, let's look at how to be strategic about it, right? Your strategy paper should look something like this. Again, because there's a, a lot of complexity in this question. And this, if you see this question in your first verbal section, drop it. Not worth it. <laughs> uh, because, you know, if, if I look at the first verbal section, the scored first verbal section, the average difficulty is going to be medium which means that you're going to have an even distribution of easy, medium, and hard questions. Um, this is a hard question, right? Um, and this is probably one of the few hard questions. You're going to spend about four minutes trying to solve it, double checking it. Not worth it. Mark it, move on. You know, maybe guess in this case, but you want to ensure that you get everything else right. 
but if you get this in the second section, then maybe it's good to invest a time. I think we can have more of a conversation about those strategies in the Q&A. Um, looking at the sentence, uh, actually looking at the answer options, I forgot what the answers are. Let's solve this together. Right? Um, only with the discovery of an ozone hole over the Antarctic did chemical companies finally relinquish their position to ban CFCs, which destroyed ozone. The discovery suggested that strong political action to halt production of CFC might be blank. And fortunately, the industry yielded. Then it says this, the colon. The colon is used to explain or expand on an idea or give an example of something, right? So usually if there's a blank here after the colon or before the colon, whatever comes after is an explanation to that particular thing. That's just a heads up, right? Uh, many of us do not notice that in the heat of the moment. So it's, it's like a explanation word. All the companies had recently blanked their research into CFC substitutes. Studies they had initially years earlier had produced, had produced blank results. Again, there are multiple layers to deal with this. The easiest one, the first blank. We know that they are banning CFCs. They want to ban CFCs. Um, so therefore, the suggestion of strong political action against CFC might be inevitable, right? Might be definite. Because that's what the sentence says, that um, finally they relinquish their opposition, so they are not opposed to it anymore, and the government is all for banning them. So then this uh, proposition of political action to ban it will be quite obvious. It's going to happen. Imminent means that it's going to happen, right? Imprudent would be unwise. Prudent is to be wise. Prudent is to be wise. Imprudent is to be unwise. You know, I've, I've told my students before, it's a late in the morning, you know, you've seen these ads, what I say is a prudential. What they essentially want you to think is that if you do this, it's wise for your, you know, for your future. That's essentially what they're trying to get at. Uh, premature, again, makes no sense because they've spent a lot of time on this. It's been a long time coming. Um, and the opposition has, in fact, agreed to the other side. So it's not premature. So I get rid of those A's that I don't answer for the first one. <clears throat> Let's look at the context again. <clears throat> Fortunately, the chemical industry no longer felt compelled to oppose such action. What that means, therefore, is that they have gone ahead and said, you know, I'm not going to produce CFCs anymore. Whatever follows will be an explanation of that. It will be in line with that. It says, although companies had recently dashed the research into CFC substitutes, studies they had initiated years earlier had produced dashed results. So think about it. If they have said that they will not produce CFCs or CFC substances, what will be their view towards CFC substitutes? They have to replace CFCs, right? So obviously they've made some, um, some progress towards CFC substitutes. That is what this context suggests. And it can really throw you off because of this although, but you have to look at the context and understand what he's trying to say or what she is trying to say. And what they're trying to say is that these companies have moved from CFCs to producing alternatives, viable alternatives. Third blank is the easy one. So what do we know about that? Their research into substitutes had produced some kind of results. So they're against CFCs, they said they'll stop making CFCs, and the explanation is that they've done something with CFC substitutes. So obviously they must have made some, broken some ground, produced good or viable Results. Again, this is a complicated question because a lot of the answer is there in the context. The answer for good or viable, something positive, encouraging could work, inconclusive is not a positive thing in this case. Unsurprising also is not positive. It's, if it's unsurprising, it will not be innovative, nothing new happens. Uh, G is the right answer here. And that's the pivotal blank, right? Once you get that, the rest falls in place. So we know that they ban, they're going to ban CFCs and the companies are in line and they've worked on an alternative uh, for CFCs and that has given results. Looking at this particular context, although companies had recently dashed the research, we know that they've gotten good results, but the word although suggests that something opposite has happened. What have they done recently with these research? Well, 
they may they might have recently stopped or uh, you know slowed down because this is contrary to the uh, tone that says that they made progress with um, research earlier so look at the contrast earlier recently so there are two timelines uh, contrasting each other and again the context is very important it is a very difficult question right and um, so slow down or stop something negative corroborate is to provide additional information to support that does not play in with the although I'll come back to that right I'll finish this and then we'll just explain whatever um, lack of clarity you might have publicize doesn't go in line with it is not the opposite of encourage curtail means to slow down and that's essentially the process coming to your questions use of although may mean that the results were not successful correct and that's the problem right um, that's why there's a difficult question because you need to rely on the context um, so the semicolon now the colon whatever comes here and whatever comes there this will explain that if you put an although there then you have to consider the entire situation there right for instance uh, he is uh, generous again this might be grammatically wrong so don't hold me up to it he is generous and then I use an explanation although he is broke he helps right so I'm not trying to say that he is broke that's not the idea I'm trying to convey I'm saying that he's generous and that this and this entire thing is evidence of that right and again forgive my handwriting for those who know who I am you already know that I have terrible handwriting uh, uh, so whatever follows here is an explanation of what is established here which is that fortunately they no longer need to create CFCs if they no longer need CFCs, what is their outlook towards substitutes? That they made certain progress towards it. Hope that makes sense. And we can come back to this later if required. Let me know if anything else needs to make it. So I need to look at this entire context. So this entire context says that they have made grounds in CFC substitutes. But considering that there is an author here, now they are not doing anything. But they've done soft stuff in the past, right? And this is why they're in line with banning CFCs. Uh, again, a, a reasonably complicated question. The lesson to be learned here. All right, so pay attention to recently, earlier. So they came up with the results earlier, and they had good results earlier already. And even though right now they're not focusing on it, they already have good results. So the timeline is the switch. And once you realize that there's a timeline switch, this makes sense. Yeah, again, I can come back to this later if you need. Um, remember, for text completion questions, especially the big ones, context matters. You, you may not be in some situations look at a particular word and make a decision right so you will you you will obviously predict for those words much later on predict for those blanks much later on but sometimes you need to understand the context and this is why when you read the sentence first get the gist right a lot of solving the question will require you to understand what the general gist of the sentence is let's put this all together try this one out um Again, reasonably easier compared to the others. So remember, be methodical. Don't flout the rules. No, that, that is yet to come. Uh, be methodical. Ensure that you use context. Do not go with your gut. Right? Go with the method. Always.
<clears throat> also heads up this may go a little beyond one o'clock um, i am recording it i didn't record the entire thing but i recorded it from uh, sort of the middle um I will share the link with you if you have to leave for each other. But I would suggest not leaving it. Stay until the Q&A, um, <clears throat> which will be, you know, you can ask your more complex stats. Any, um, that seems to be the trend. Okay. Um, <clears throat> hmm. This might actually be an issue of not very, Contextually understood vocabulary. <clears throat> Let's see. So it says, unlike the problems in recent financial scandals, issues raised by the regulators in this case appears appear largely to pertain to unwieldy accounting rules that are open to widely divergent interpretations. <clears throat> and then it takes, a, takes an aside and says, not to dash transactions designed to blank corporate maleficians. Um, so maleficians, uh, mal means evil or bad. Um, this is to do, like factor, do. Uh, malefactor, maleficiary. Uh, maleficence is evil doing or you know, bad doing, doing bad things, unethical things intentionally. <clears throat> Again, context matters. So overall, when I think about it, it says that the recent problems is because of accounting issues rather than actual deliberate, um, deliberate, what is that word? Um, you know, doing something bad. Yeah. Uh, deliberate acts of criminality, right? Um, and that's the context. So it, it explains that. It says it's probably unwieldy accounting rules. And it says not something else. So what is it not? It is not deliberate deliberate um, criminal activity, right? That's what this context should say. <laughs> so let's try to fill in the blanks based on the, their own specific context. Um, so what are we talking about in the blank? We're talking about um, the scandals. No, is it about the scandals? All right, it, it relates to what it pertains to. <clears throat> what seems to be the reason why these scandals happen. And the reason is accounting rules, not some kind of transactions designed to dash corporate maleficence. Um, so what will these transactions do? Well, um, they're doing something with respect to hiding these kind of bad transactions, right? Um, so essentially, these it's, this would say that these scandals arise for, for uh, accounting reasons, not because they're trying to hide <coughs> corporate maleficence. Again, contextual. There's no clear word that suggests that this is the answer, but the, um, but the context provides enough information for me to um, answer that. One second, let me just quickly check if there are any contextual cues. Fair enough, there's nothing else. Um, <clears throat> so the answer for this would be <clears throat> cloak. Cloak is to mask or hide. Ameliorate is to make less 
well, bad, for lack of a better word. Uh, the root mel means soft or fine, like melodious, mellow. Uh, ameliorate means to make something softer. Um, for example, someone is very angry and you try to ameliorate the situation by doing something nice. Uh, ameliorate and ameliorate mean the same thing. Uh, roots can be a little, etymology can be a little dodgy. Uh, there are exceptions. Again, you know, if you've registered, I will send you the course um, that should help you isolate any problems that you might have with that. Um, so though ameliorate seems like they're trying to make it, they're trying to hide it, um, it doesn't show that they're trying to hide it really. It shows that they're trying to make it better, um, which doesn't really fit the context of hide. Illuminate is a 180, right? When you illuminate, you bring it to light. The meaning of what again? Oh. Which one? Second blank? Why are you being cryptic, man? <laughs> Before not. Mm. We haven't gone into that yet. Uh, I'm going into that now, right? Uh, so the, the transactions were designed to mask corporate malefeasance. So what kind of transactions were they? Well, they were probably shady transactions, right? Uh, they were um, unscrupulous transactions because, again, they're suggesting that um, you know, there are scandals, they are maleficients, it's not that. Oh, that, oh, oh, fair enough. I, I get it, I get it now. All right, I'll, I'll explain that and then I'll come back to your question. All right, fair enough. Uh, so the word that's closest to sham or fake is, uh, shady or fake is sham. Um, Unpremeditated means it wasn't intentional. Justifiable also misses the mark, right? Uh, if it's justifiable, it means you also think that such transactions are valid, which is not the case. Um, uh, no, so one question at a time, right? So I will talk about what Amitya said. The dash there can be used, it's not a hyphen, it's a dash, uh, can be used instead of a comma, right? Uh, I need to go into grammar for this. I, I actually planned talking about grammar, but heck, let's talk about it. <laughs> so sometimes you can add on an additional piece of information right in the end by using a comma. For example, um, I met my dog, oh, I met my dog, um, you know, um, I met my dog in the park, running, uh, running down the street. Uh, it's a terrible sentence, but just illustrate the grammar of it. The running down the street is a, is a bit of an information that's nice to know, but it's not important. It's not the main idea of the passage, or even the secondary. It's a nice to know information. In grammatical, term, grammatical terms, it's called a parenthetical phrase or parenthetical clause, because you can put a you can put a parenthesis, a bracket around it and it'll do the same job. That's what a comma does. You can also do that by splicing sentences. You can put information in between two commas, clauses and phrases, and they will do the same job as that. I could say, I met my dog walking in the park, uh, no, walking in the street, comma, in the park. It's an awkward sentence, but it illustrates the point. Um, coming to your question, what, what does a dash do? Well, a dash is, does the same job as a comma, but it shows something that is less relevant than, a, than with a comma. It shows an aside, a side point. Um, that's pretty much it. It's a punctuation. It does the same job as a comma for all intents and purposes. Right? Um, so it is, this is essentially a, a nice to have information. So I make that conclusion based on the, the details that have already been given. Um, Coming to Preeti, so the actual purpose of unwieldy transaction is to hide. Right, so it's saying these recent financial scandals are because of shady transactions. But because it says unlikely, this recent issue is not shady. It's just that 
there's overwhelming rules, right? And then he qualifies that and says, it is not this, it's rather that. So I need to essentially double back to financial scandals. That's pretty much it. That's the only other contextual view that I have. Right? Again, if there are queries, let me know. All right. Let's get move on to sanity premiums. Um, yeah, you're right. Uh, the, this particular issue is not shady, but generally it has been. It's just clarifying that for that sense. You're right. So you're going to see four questions of science equivalence um, in your GRE in each section of verbal. And I don't know about you, but I want to get every single one of them right. Because they're very high impact in the sense that your return on investment is really, really high. You can spend under one minute on each of these questions. And if you're methodical and if you're strategic, you can get them right. Getting four questions right in four minutes is insanely beneficial. Right? You do not want to be mucking it about. Right? For a lack of, you know, I'm saying it as it is. And we mess things up quite a bit because we are human beings. Uh, you know, think about this this way, right? Uh, there's data suggesting that human beings have been around for a few hundred thousand years, maybe 100,000 years, uh, like Homo sapiens uh, in whatever form we have. Our, our brains haven't really changed that much in the last 60,000 years. Uh, again, the accurate number might be different, but the ballpark is more or less the same. It hasn't evolved or it hasn't changed in the last 60,000 years. And here we are in our modern day situation making decisions that are way above our heads, right? And the journey is specifically designed to see if you can overcome those, those evolutionary uh, constraints that we have in our thought processes and make decisions more rationally. Let's look at some examples of those, right? Before that, let's look at what the science balloon question is. The, the, if you look at the detail or the, you know, the, the diet, the, what is that word for instruction now? Teach this out. The instructional text. Um, it says, select two answer choices that when used to complete the sentence, fit the meaning of the sentence as a whole, and produce completed sentences that are alike in meaning. There are two things to consider here. One, just as in text completion, the blank or the word should fit the context. But there's another complication. There's an and there. And if you know probability, you know what the difference between and and or are, right? Um, so it has to both fit the context and two, you need to pick two answer options that both create the same meaning in context. They both have to say create the same meaning. It can't be that both of them work, but they create slightly different meanings. Both have to create the same meaning. What that means is that you may come, come across situations where you have more than two valid right answers. So you have to make a call as to which of these two answer options create a synonymous context. That said, the answer options do not be synonymous. If you're looking for synonyms, you're going to fail, right? And again, as we've discussed, context is different from definitions. We'll see how to weed this out. So these are the steps. As with text completion, read the text completely. Don't fill in the blank as you read. Work the blank. Find the keyword. Um, find the trigger words if there are. Make a prediction, jot this prediction down in your scratch paper. Uh, evaluate the answer options, write down A, B, C, D, E, F, or there are six, and decide what you want to do with each of them. Put your you know, evaluation marks in each of them. It's very rare that you'll see tick marks, right? Because you'll always have a little bit of doubt. <laughs> and finally, this is an optional step. If you have more than one right answer, right? If let's say A, B, C, D, E, F, and if you have right three of them, and put them into the context and see which of these are creating the same meaning. One of these will be an odd man out. Pick the one that creates similar meaning. Again, as um, queries develop, let me know. Try this one out. And remember the rules. Two right answers every single time, right? With sentence equivalence, it will always be two right answers. You'll know it's sentence equivalence because there's only one sentence, one blank and six answer options, and there will be a checkbox instead of an oval. Oval means only one. Checkbox means probably more than one, in this case, two. If you get one right, one wrong, no brownie points. I have to get both of them right. Try this out. Let me know what your analysis is.
two right answers. Not just one, two. That way, both of them right, none of them wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about this. Again, this will take much less time than it takes completion question. That's the point. If you want to be methodical, you don't want to rush things through. If you take a few, let's say you take five seconds more than you usually would um, within, you know, in a, in a minute kind of situation, but it'll ensure that you get it right, then you should do that, right? Um, let's look at the sentence. Skeptics contend that any scheme for charging visitors to, vis to, to websites that rewards vendors adequately would require steep prices. Blank the kind of frequency, uh, casual use of web sites that surface now take for granted. So it essentially by charging, it says it will do something to the, um, to the kind of usage. What will it do to the casual use of websites? Well, it will it will stop, slow down. But it may not stop, right? They, they may still, oh, maybe because it's casual use. Fair enough. It could be that. So stop or slow down or discourage. Yeah, that's a that's a good word. Discourage. Right. Let's compare that. Right. Same process. Uh, there's just one more answer option. Let's see how to deal with this. Brightly. So just as you would bridle a horse to restrain it, to prevent it from doing whatever the hell it wants, um, bridle someone, something is bridling, it is, it is um, impeding or it's preventing you from being completely free to do whatever you want. This could work, sort of means restraining, to be restrained. Uh, exciting is opposite. Forbidding could work to prevent, to stop, right? That would work. Inhibiting could work. It also means to restrain. Provoke, again, provoke could be anything, right? It could provoke them to use more, provoke them to use less. It, may, it could mean to anger them. But there's no contextual reference to prove that they'll be angered. Reversing is a little too strong. Reversing the kind of frequency can, uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, correct. So, because think about the, the context, right? You may not be able to reverse, how do you reverse frequent usage of a website? What does that even mean? I don't know, and if you're still stuck on that, where is the pair for it? What other word means reversing, right? It doesn't work. Looking at A, C, and D. In context, bright lane means to prohibit, not prohibit, to restrain, Inhibiting means restrain. Forbidding means uh, prevent completely from doing, which there is no pair for. While this is a valid answer option, this could be true, there is no pair for it. So I have to get rid of it. The answers, therefore, are A and B. Right? So don't flout the rules. Don't uh, pick answers that are right, but you haven't applied all the rules to. Step five was important here where you have more than one right answer, or more than two right answers, and you should check for context to see if they create the same meaning. Mm, not necessarily. Again, these are parenthetical phrases. Uh, it becomes a, uh, I don't want to go to grammar, right? <laughs> it becomes a, um, it becomes something called a participial modifier. I don't want to go into it, but it's it's fine. It, it, reversing should be fine grammatically. Right? I, I, again, I do not want to go about it, uh, go into grammar because GRE is quite painful as it is. <laughs> let's not add more complexity to it. Um, let's try this out. Again, you should be able to solve this in under a minute. 
irrespective of get, whether you get the right, right answer or not, you should be able to solve this in the minute. Uh, so in pretty in the A, um, it meant to inhibit. Bridling is to prevent. Uh, prevent, not prevent. Bridling is to uh, put resistance on movement. Whereas forbidding means to completely stop, right? to prohibit. It. So that, that's a little more extreme. Contraction meaning does change. Bridling is to put restraints on to prevent the full movement of, like, it, like a horse has these bridles, right, complete um, accouterment of things that it has to wear so that it can be controlled, it can be restrained. Uh, literally, bridle means that. Yes. Hmm. Another situation where you can easily pick the wrong pair. Could you give me the answers? Fair enough. Two answers. All right, so it's a similar situation as before. Um, when I look at the sentence, it says, notwithstanding they're blank. <laughs> Why are you afraid? Uh, Are you talking about this question or the previous one? I will come to that. Let, let's evaluate this, then we'll come back to that. Um, notwithstanding the blank regarding other issues, township residents have consistently passed the board of education's annual budget. So what that means is that with other issues, they're different. But with this particular issue, board of education's annual budget, they always pass, meaning that they always come to an agreement, right? They make decisions when it comes to this. So suggesting that in this case, in other issues, they they are you know quite um, disagreeable. Wait, looking at the one, not disagreement. Disagreement or disaccord. Something is suggesting that they are contrary to each other. Um, correct. Accord is the opposite. It means they are together. Indecision could actually work. If you are indecisive, you will not be able to make a decision. Suggesting that you will not be able to pass a resolution in such a case. But in these cases, they are decisive. We could keep B. Consensus is similar to accord. They are both. Um, they can be used in similar situations, although they're not synonyms. Accord is when everyone is is of the same um, is of the same spirit, if I can call it that. Consensus, consensus is when everyone comes to an agreement. Right? Like the jury was in consensus about uh, the, the 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 culprit's lack of innocence. Right? They all came to an agreement. Accord is to be together in spirit. So even though they can be interchanged sometimes, they're not necessarily synonymous. Um, close, but not the same. Disagreement could work because we have disagreement. Divergence could also work, which means you're different. Your, your um, opinions are different from each other. Enthusiasm is also out. Um, when I look at the context, however, these two mean that you have different opinions. This means you're not able to synthesize an opinion, a different meaning, right? D and E, therefore, are the right answers. Good job. They're not the same. Again, the right answers need not be synonymous, but they will create the same meaning in context. And there's a difference between those two things. In fact, sometimes there are situations where uh, the two right answers are completely different definition-wise, but they still are the right answers because contextually they mean the same thing. 
So uh, a corollary to that, never pick answer options that are not like your, your process of elimination or your process of selection should not be, okay, these two answer options are synonymous, therefore they must be the answer. That should never be the process. Use the method, right? Um, evaluate, make a prediction, compare that to the prediction and be methodical. There are a lot of back traps set uh, to make your life harder than it should be. Um, again, making a similar point, try this out. And again, I'll explain what choice support bias means. Did not what the sentence of it? Yeah. Did not get the sentence? Hmm, this is a tough one. This is a tough one. Okay. Um, whoopsie. One second, I lost all the chats. Uh, da, 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 da. ANF analog means did not have an equivalent in the analog means an equivalent of an analogy of um, a polar equivalent of. Right? Uh, if it says it did not have an analog, it means yes. It means what you say. Um, let's do the context. So the key. The, so well, think about it from a psychological perspective. When you're faced with a situation that's very complex, when you don't know all the facts, when you well, when you when you can't process all the facts, chances are that you will look at your options, and your eye wanders. Uh, if it sounds a little bit like uh, I'm alluding to something else, I am. Right? You look at your options, and whatever catches your eye, you sort of decide that that's the one, right? And then your logical brain sort of reiterates that. It says, you know what? There's X, Y, Z proof that this could work. Therefore, it sounds good. Perfect. That's a terrible way to go about life scientifically. Right? Um, scientifically, you look at the data and then make a synthesis based on the data rather than figure out a thesis and then find data for it. That's terrible science. Many questions will put you in a place where you have, where you end up making or doing choice support bias. Where you look at an answer option, you decide right then and there that that's the answer. There is no logical backing for it. it. just You just feel that it's right. And then you support that decision by looking for opinions. This is very true, or this is very apparent, especially when it comes to um, when it comes to reading comprehension and critical reasoning questions. Sometimes true for text completion and sentence equivalence questions. Right? Um, so to avoid that, as I've been 
harping along so far. Be methodical. Let's see what you do, right? The stories of silent drama may often have been blank, yet within those broad outlines, the true artists among silent film actors could express shadings that had no immediate analog in language. So what it's saying is that silent films, films are of a particular weight, and what we know about it is that they're quite broad. We also know that they generally don't have shades of meaning. An actor can bring in shades of meaning, but silent drama as a medium does not have shades of meaning itself. So what does that mean? What are they trying to say about silent drama? They're trying to say that it is quite bland. It is without specifics. It's all black and white, or it's very gray, right? It's very nebulous, if I can call it that. Very basic, very good, right? So it has been without, without, um, what should I say, uh, subtlety or to be more uh, simple without, um, you know, without complexity or colors, you know, there's something that's very simple, something that's very basic. Look at the answer options. Uh, again, before I go there, I hope that makes sense. We chose the clues, we've, or rather we identify the clues, we made a decision based on what it said. The yet told me that it's the other way around. Implausible means something that is not possible, right? That doesn't mean subtle or lacking subtlety. Incredible means unbelievable. Something that's too amazing to be real. That's also how. Conventional, well, you could say that, but does conventional have to mean without subtlety, without color, something that's bland? Not necessarily, right? Not necessary. Right? Uh, to be bland. Elemental means basic. It means without finer lining. It means it's the most rudimentary form. So does rudimentary. Confusing could also work, where you might have looked at that and said, you know, it's, it's a broad outline, so therefore it must be confusing. Well, does it necessarily mean that something that has a broad outline is also confusing? It didn't say it has a broad outline with uh, with interchangeable or confusing meaning or where the meaning could be misunderstood. It doesn't say that. So confusing also doesn't work. Also, it doesn't really have a pair. The answers, therefore, are elemental and rudimentary. Right? While you see it this way, it makes a lot of sense. It's obvious. But when you solve it, it didn't make too much sense. It was very ambiguous because you look at the answer options and you would have gone through all of them. You would have been all right. I'm not sure about these. Maybe this could work. Terrible idea, right? Be methodical. Use scratch paper. If you scratch something out, it's out. Um, don't revisit answer options that you've objectively eliminated comparing it with the prediction, right? That's it. Does that make sense? Does the prediction make sense? If there are any queries, let me know. So let's put this all together. That will, this will be the last question for the day. Uh, the last you know, problem for the day. <laughs> Try that. The previous one was um, just going to go there quickly. Elemental and rudimentary.
Okay. Despite a relaxed and flexible style, whatever her name is, is blank businesswoman who knows how to market her brand. And the colon herself means this is her brand. Her brand equals herself. That's a distractor. Don't worry too much about that. So she is relaxed and flexible, yet, it says despite, she is a, some kind of businesswoman. So if you're relaxed and flexible, the usual connotation is that you're easygoing, you're, you let things slide, right? So we need something opposite to that. Not completely opposite, but something that could still exist while still be relaxed and uh, flexible. So she's probably a, um, she is a, um, you know, a, a, a competent, um, good businesswoman. She's very good at business, right? Okay, so the, if you have three answers, let's check it by putting it back in the context. Let's go there. Ruthless is a negative connotation. It doesn't go along with this related and flexible uh, connotation that is provided. Creative, well, could work. Let's see. Canny means to be a very shrewd. It's to be very shrewd, to be very keen in your decision making. Canny. So you could work. Industrious could work as well to be very hard working. Shrewd could also work. Effective could also work. What have I done? Okay. <laughs> okay. So there are multiple answers that you could select. But the rule is. Can I have a pair among these answers? Do I have a pair for creative? She is creative businesswoman. Is there another word which means creative? No. Is there another word which means she's very shrewd? Yes, there is. So let's keep these two. Industrious means hardworking. Is there any other word in context which you mean hardworking? No, it does not. Effective doesn't mean hardworking. Effective means you're able to achieve what achieve the result for whatever you do, right? It doesn't even mean you're efficient. It just means you're able to achieve results. It has nothing to do with hard working. So while they look similar, they, 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 in context, they mean nothing similar at all. They're very different words. The answer, therefore, is C and E. This is a tough one, right? And I, I guess most of you got it wrong. And that's by design. It, it is a tough question. There are a lot of answer options that are very close to each other. This is probably one of those questions you can only see if you did really well in the first section and, the, and you saw a really hard section in the second one. But even in those cases, yes, true is to be keen, but also to be very, um, very um, street smart. S smart, not, not just street smart, to be smart in uh, making decisions you're not easily taking advantage of, right? Uh, not really. Uh, it, uh, shrewd is a positive word. Uh, manipulative is another extreme. But shrewd is to be someone who will sense BS, who will not be easily manipulated, who cannot be taken advantage of, and can make rational good decisions. Shrewd. So does the word canny mean. Uh, well, industrious could mean detail oriented. The other don't necessarily mean that. Not necessarily. It could be people who are shrewd could be detail oriented. Need not be. Right. Uh, so it has to do with decision making. The answers therefore are serious. So again, by being methodical, by ensuring that you are able to, you know, you had five answers that could have been possible. But by checking if there were a, there was a pair, we eliminated answers one one by one, and that's important. Step five can be very useful, especially for these really hard questions. This takes me to the final leg. Any questions? So whatever queries you have, let's have a quick discussion about it and sort of wind up for the day. Correct. So any queries, anything that you want to clarify? Yes, you're right. Uh, 
Um, sure, I can do that. So if you guys have um, have registered for the webinar in the form, then I can send it to you. I'll send you the presentation as well, right? Um, and I'll send you other things as as well. Uh, the vocabulary course, I'll enroll you to that. I will also um, give you a heads up about the admissions session that is going to happen. So going back to that question, right? It said, the question said, the stories of silent drama may often have been blank, yet with those broad outlines, so it's talking about these dramas, the true artists among silent films can express shades. So an artist can do it, but the medium is devoid of that. So we need something which is broad, which is not very specific, and doesn't have too many layers to it, something that's very simple. Yes, I can do that as well. I will upload it, and I will share the video link as well. That's definitely doable. Um, yeah, so our prediction was basic or without complexity, and therefore we picked elementary and rudimentary. Elemental and rudimentary. Right? Right. So from my end, I will send you those things. I will send you the video of reading comprehension. So if you had missed reading comprehension, um, there was a webinar that happened two weeks back, and that touches on the important aspects and advanced strategies on how to deal with reading comprehension questions. Very helpful if you're already a little um, you know, acquainted with the GRD. <laughs> sure, Amitya, we can do that. Uh, which one are you talking about? Both or a specific one? <laughs> All right, fair enough. Um, second, whoever has enrolled, registered for this, I will add you to the course, to the vocabulary course. If you haven't registered, go ahead and register yourself through the mail that we sent you. Um, and we will keep you in the loop about the MS admission perspective. And that is a very, that's going to be a very useful uh, discussion. And um, you know, it will give you a lot of insight as to what you need to be doing in the next year. Right? It will help you plan that better. Um, again, I'm not going to talk about that right now because I am not the expert. My co-founder is, and I will have him schedule that next week. Um, what I want from you is register for this today's webinar. We've attended already, but if you haven't already registered so that I can get your email and I can add you to the course, I can send you the details. Can send you the content I promised. Um, so the video of today and um, and what else? The uh, there's something else. Uh, the PPT, right? I'll send you that as well. Uh, I want you to try and internalize this. Um, try practicing official questions. Uh, you, you can access. You can find access to the official questions if you're clever enough. But ideally, I would suggest pick up a copy of the book. You know. Um, the official guide and the verbal review. If you're focusing on verbal, those are good resources. Those have, those have really high quality GRE questions. Everything else out there in the market is a version of it, right? It's not the same. Continue, and of course, continue being awesome, right? If you have any queries, if you want to extend, um, you know, um, or if you want help with your GRE preparation or your admission services, we provide both of those. Uh, get in touch with me if at plus prep. Right? Um, you can mail me. I do not promise that I will immediately get in touch with you, get back to you because. My email gets flooded quite quickly, but I will definitely get back to you, right? Whatever your queries are. Yes. Uh, well, the official books from ETS are required. Are they enough? I don't think so. There, you need more practice resources, right? Because the official resources helps you get an understanding of what the GRE is, helps you uh, learn strategic skills and apply them on actual GRE questions. But you will need more. 